My name is Patrick Kitzior. Uh, I'm the founder and CEO of Boiling Ice, as well as a mobile learning platform called Kidzo, which is also a content platform called Kidzo Dental. And when I'm not building my own startups, um, I like to share my own experience as an entrepreneur. Let's get started. So this is what you're all investing in, right? You want the winning horse so that you can make as much money as possible for yourself and your investors. And there's a lot of magic sauce that goes into picking a winning team. What we're going to do today is we're going to look at a number of those items that others have found to be good and that research has found to also be a contributing factor. I mean, the first thing is that why are tech teams all that different from other teams? Many of you made your fortune perhaps in real estate, or oil and gas, or commodities, and those businesses are very different. Right? You have a steady cash flow. You're doing something that's generally been done before. You're not the first building that somebody built. You're not the first gas pipeline that's been built. Right? Those have been established businesses that people understand. And it's easy to find talent because other people have done it in the past. The big difference with tech companies is that you're investing, you're creating excuse me, something brand new generally creating something that's never been done before. When Zuckerberg created Facebook, he didn't say, hmm, no, let me, let me look at the other Facebooks that have been created before. You might say that maybe there were a few others, but truly Facebook was the first of its kind to, to, to marshal all the various tools that were available. And you can say the same thing for a lot of other startups that came out over the last you know, 10 to 15 years. So the Twitter was the very first of its kind ever to have been developed. And that's what differentiates tech startups from others. They're brand new, there is no cash flow, and sometimes a successful business has is making no money at all, but they're building hundreds of thousands and millions of new users on an annual basis. Very, very different way of looking at life. It all gets summarized, I think in this picture, that tech startups are going to places that no one has ever gone before. Very critical. So how do you invest in a company that has never gone to where it's going? It says it's going somewhere, but how is it going to get there? Been a fair amount of research into the reasons why tech startups fail. There's a wonderful company that has great research called CB Insights. If you don't subscribe to their newsletters, I highly recommend that you do. They did a course first morning on a whole variety of startups. And what they found is that the top three reasons are no market. Need, they ran out of cash, or it was not the right team. And I think this, this slide is a little bit misleading, because if you look at all the other reasons cited for why tech startups fail, many of those are all related to a team, such as we got out competing. I'd say it's because it's a pretty stupid team. Right? They had a poor product. I'd say that's a pretty stupid team if your product is poor because you were unable to put together the talent. Or you're ignoring your customers, the ultimate stupid team. Or you lost focus, very, very stupid team. So I would say that the number one reason startups fail is because the team fails. The other reasons is only that there's no market need or that they run out of money very, very important that the team itself is absolutely critical. 
Anybody know who this gentleman is? Besides looking like an egg. So this is Mark Andreessen, one of the top investors of Silicon Valley, the co-founder of Netscape, one of the most popular browsers back from 1995. Mark has some very fine ideas about what makes a successful <coughs> investment. I found it very interesting. Today I want to share with you, you know, his thoughts, thoughts that have been gathered from a variety of research that's currently being done in the U.S. And at the end, I'm going to put it all together as a formula or a recipe that you can think of that you can follow in identifying successful teams. So what did Mark say? It's 90% people. 90% people. The other thing that said that it's a huge market opportunity and that they have a differentiating technology. So 90% people, 10% market and technology. Well, let's look at that a little bit more closely. When he talks about people, he says that the most important qualification for people is that they have courage means that they just never give up. It doesn't matter how difficult the project is, it doesn't matter what the challenge is, is that they truly believe that you just can't be the person who never gives up. And that's the quality that he's looking for. The primary number one quality that he's looking for. Truly, I think, to be an entrepreneur, you have to be a little crazy because you keep going even when things are just going bad. Most people generally quit. And the other thing he says that's important is genius. And we'll see what that means, because when we often think of genius, we often think of somebody like Einstein, somebody who's really, really smart. But we'll see that there's different types of genius. So I think this one is, is one that be quite dangerous to only focus on. So, one of the things that uh, part of a team is a winning leader. This is some research that uh, uh, came out recently, and it shows that really amongst the best leaders are those that are at the same time opinionated and adaptable. Think about that for a second. That means that I'm going to tell you that I'm absolutely right all the time, but I can change my mind. Right? So you're one thing, but you're able to be something else also. So you're, you're open-minded, but you're not. That's a very unique quality. Kind of, I put that quality in the crazy category. Because you do have to be crazy to be really opinionated about something, and yet at the same time, leave a little window open in your mind to be able to adapt because situations change. Just want to make sure you can all hear me well, the translation's working. Yes? Yes. Yes, okay. So what about picking leaders? Let's do a little interview. And ask yourself, would you hire this person? So the interviewer says to the person, so tell me a little something about yourself. Well, I dropped out of college because I was bored. And I decided to go to India and become a Buddhist instead. That would be a better use of my time than studying at the university. Well, did you study anything in particular? Did you take any technology classes? The answer is 
No, I, I didn't think they really knew what they were talking about. I, um, I, I took some, I listened to some lectures at Hewlett Packard, but I decided that they were eventually going to be out of the computer business because it was quite clear to me that that's the direction that that company was going to go. But I studied calligraphy. I think that's really important, starting a computer company. I see right here that um, he once said that uh, he took LSD. Is that true? Oh yeah, it was like the, the one or second best thing I ever did in my entire life. It was completely, you know, completely changed my point of view on things. Oh, thank you. Is there anything else you'd like to uh, to add? Goes well, you know. I never really knew my dad. And they finally got married, but they'd already given me away for adoption. Oh, and by the way, my dad is a Syrian Muslim. Any idea who that is? Would you hire that person? Would you? Steve Jobs. That's pretty crazy. Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs. Absolutely. So when you're talking to an entrepreneur that's in front of you, you've got to have an open window in your mind. Really be listening to what kind of person they are. What makes them different? Don't bring your own prejudices to the table. Keep an open mind because that crazy nutcase that just walked into your office could be the next unicorn that you said no to. Secondly, Larry Page. Very, very successful. Very, very smart. And they did something quite interesting besides starting Google. They actually questioned the quality of their people. Google, for many, many years, always had one simple philosophy. We only hire top engineers from the top schools. You can only hire the top engineers from the top schools. So if you didn't go to a top school, you didn't graduate from a top engineering degree, you were not getting hired at Google. But then they realized that something strange was happening at Google. And they decided that because they're small, then let's do a data study. So they did a massive data study of all their personnel. And what they found is that there were 10 characteristics that defined who made the best managers at Google. And here's what they found. Number one, they were a good coach. Number two, they empower the team and they do not micromanage. They create an inclusive environment. They're very productive, results oriented. They're good communicators. They have a clear vision for the team. They may have technical skills to help the team, but it's not really the most important thing about them. And they collaborate across Google and their strong decision making. It doesn't say they're the best programmer that we have. It doesn't say, you know, they're the best technical person. And it's their technology because they're applying it. But they're very, very good team leaders. I know that goes against a lot of what we, we think of as being amongst the top reasons for hiring or investing in startup teams. So what they found is that you can't fit a square peg in a round hole. Because that's what they that's what they were trying to do. So they changed. And now they hire people from very diverse backgrounds, literature backgrounds, and economics, political science, archaeology. And there's something interesting about diversity. 
And this comes from some more studies that have been done. That if you want the highest potential for innovation in an organization, you have to have teams that have, at the same time, shared goals and diverging values. That's like saying, well, our goal is to get to the top of the mountain. And our values are, some of us may want to take the road, and some of us may want to take a car. Different ways of getting to the top. And we know that that's the top. What, that creates tension. It means everybody needs to talk about different ways of reaching the top of the mountain. The other quality that successful teams have is that they create very, very successful partnerships in the company. They're able to disagree with their fellow employees, fellow team members, and at the same time, they're able to support them. To me, that means they have a great deal of respect for each other. Sometimes you'll be wrong, sometimes I'll be wrong. So let's talk this through. Let's make sure we've got the right answer here. And then there's something called the angelic troublemakers. Those people that are all mm, very nice, but they disagree. They make you look at things differently that you weren't expecting to. They say, no, 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 no. That's not the way to go. And then there are the great innovators. Somebody who's optimistic, and yet skeptical at the same time. Yes, we're going to make it, but I'm not so sure. Okay. So what do you find with that? You have a yin and a yang. Right? You have this certain element of conflict that's built in to successful teams. They work well together, but they challenge each other. And it's that diversity that makes them even more successful than traditional teams where everybody is the same. Now let's explore this idea of diversity a bit more. Not too long ago, the Boston Consulting Group did a very large study with Mass Challenge, which is an incubator in Massachusetts, in the US. And they surveyed 350 startups. And here's what they found. Male startups receive more money than startups led by women. However, with the money that the women receive, they were able to get more revenues. So women got 56% less dollars, and yet with those dollars that they received, they were able to do two and a half times of revenue. So if I'm an investor, I'm thinking, boy, I can make a lot more money investing in women than in men, right? So this is what you have to think about. Don't let your prejudices guide your decisions. Look at the reality and look at the facts. You say, well, that's startup teams. I've got my, I, my VC team, my angel team. Here's a study that was done on venture capital teams that appeared in the Harvard Business Review, a small publication that I'm sure you well know. Now, most VCs in the US, they're all the same. Right? It's mostly white men who all went to either Harvard, MIT, or Stanford. Very simple. Only 8% are women, but half the country is women. Only 2% are Hispanics, but 18% of the country is Hispanic. And only 1% are black, but 12% of the country is white. Very, very homogenous. Now, here's what happens when you have that kind of homogenous group. Right? People of the same race will work together. They have a propensity to work together more than 39% of the time. 
And if they went to the same school, they had a propensity to work together that's greater than 34%. Now why, I guess they will so what? Well, here's what the survey says. People that work on a particular deal that were in the same race, And a lower investment success measured anywhere from 26 to 32 percent. That's, that's a lot. They're leaving a lot of money on the table. And then if they went to the same school, their success rate was lower by 11 and a half percent. So if I'm running a VC fund, I want people to really mix it up. I don't want people from the same school working on the same project. And I don't want people from the same race working on the same project. Mixing it up. It's that mixing it up that's the magic. And you've got one of the greatest examples of magic right here in Russia. Perhaps, certainly, you know, one of the greatest sports teams ever assembled. National hockey team, team in the Soviet Union, 1964 to 1988, won six out of eight Olympic gold medals. It's unbelievable performance. I mean, just unbelievable. So, what are the things that we can learn from this team? Right? Was it the environment? Was it the coaching? Was it the water? What made them so great? Well, what's interesting is what happens to this team when you take them out of the environment that they were used to? And they go to the US. There are about five Russian hockey players that went to the US. And they went to different teams, Canadian Canucks, um, a whole variety of different teams, and they were absolutely terrible. None of the teams they played for won national titles. It's terrible. But there was one coach in the US, the Detroit Red Wings, who said, oh, these guys are good. I, I got to have them. Plus, they're really cheap. So he brings them all back, all together, all on the ice together, and in one year, their performance just skyrockets. One of the players in the previous season scored three goals with the, with the Devils, that same player scored 72 goals. As Fedesov, team captain for the Soviet team, said, I, we, were like, we were like fish back in water. Their magic was that they played as a team, not individual players. Their magic was the fact that they had great leadership. Tarasov, the original coach, I'm not going to talk about the second coach, which nobody liked. Right? And Fedosov, who was a team captain after 1980. They had courage. They never stopped. They were amazing. You couldn't stop them. Right? They practiced all the time. They played all the time. They knew their job. They worked together as a team. That to me was their genius. And each player was, they were good players individually, but together they had incredible strength. And it was their diversity and their creativity that made them incredibly strong. And they had really unique leadership. Right? Two leaders that were truly loved. And those are the qualities that make for great teams. You don't have to go far to find out where the great teams are. I want to summarize for you and give you the recipe for building a successful team. 
It's a little bit like a boar soup. Everybody does it a little bit differently. Right? But it really tastes really, really good at the end. But they all have similarities. So what makes for a really successful startup team? Again, yeah. it's 90% people, 10% other. We're people with courage and genius. Not necessarily smarter, but just better. Maybe different might be a better word. You take those and you mix them all together so they work well together. You add great leaders. Maybe they're a little crazy. You season it with diversity. More diversity and even more diversity. Backgrounds, thinking, gender, race. You put it in a bowl with huge market opportunity. You make sure that the technology is absolutely great. You really want to serve it with lots and lots of funding. Right? If you follow these, this recipe, you're sure to have a successful team as well as a successful startup team. Here's to the crazy ones, the misfits, the rebels, the troublemakers, the round pegs in the square holes, the ones who see things differently. They're not fond of rules, and they have no respect for the status quo. You can quote them, disagree with them, glorify or vilify them. About the only thing you can't do is ignore them because they change things. They push the human race forward. And while some may see them as the crazy ones, we see genius. Because the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who do. If you haven't seen that commercial, it's, I think it summarizes a lot about entrepreneurship that I've been talking about. It's about the crazy ones. It's about those that want to change the world. Those that want to really, really make a difference. So I want, just want to say, Ulachi, Zarabota, Rongo, Ele, Jose Marati, Sias. Make sure I said it correctly. Thank you very much.